Hello and welcome to Horror Fanatic, the podcast that helps you find new, emerging, and undiscovered horror podcast content. I'm Greg, the host and curator of Horror Fanatic. If you are a horror fanatic, click that subscribe button now. This episode is a podcast feature episode. If you like the creator, check out the episode notes for links to subscribe. Today's episode is from Next Door Villain. Next Door Villain relates and empathizes with fictional villains in pop culture like Harley Quinn, Hades, Ghostface, The Phantom of the Opera, and way more with a bit of humor, literary art, and discussion. All right, let's get this show started. Begin. <laughs> the boys! The boys! Yes, the boys! After the blood come the boys, like sniffing dogs, running and slobbering and trying to find out where that smell comes from, where the smell is, that smell. Listen, I know where they take and that cars, I've seen it all right. Well, you're not going. Or is that one? Tell that boy you're not going or we're going to move from here. Hi, I'm Joe. And I'm Tiana. And this is Next Door Villain. A podcast where we uncover the villains to discover their humanity. They're all going to laugh at you. They're all going to laugh at you. It's really sad. They're all going to laugh at you, Tiana. <laughs> I'm 28 years old. I can handle laugh people laughing at me. Actually, no, I can't. Um... <laughs> That's that's very brave of you to admit because I, I think we think of that as sort of a high school thing. Like, yeah, in high school, everyone's gonna like point and laugh at you and you do something embarrassing. But um, it, it that sort of anxiety tracks you throughout life. You just you just learn maybe to be better at hiding it. Yeah, touche. In my case, you learn to be better at not doing embarrassing things. It's hard. Yeah. Hey, all you listeners out there, welcome to Next Door Villain Podcast with Joe and Tiana. We are here today to talk about high school embarrassment, shame, Ooh. periods, women's issues, witches, religion. Me and my dirty pillows are ready. Woo. Uh, and dirty pillows, for those of you who are listening, are boobs. Levita boobs 510. Thou shall call. Thine boobs, dirty pillows. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Carrie is a great film. Mm -hmm. It's one I saw a long time ago and just revisited we, while we were preparing for this episode, and I forgot how, how good it is. Like, it's a legitimately great film. Yeah, uh, the acting is spectacular. Carrie did a great job. Ugh, I forgot her name, but... Uh, si sissy sissy Sp Spach Spachik? Spachik? Yeah, Spachik. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the movie based on the Stephen King novel, I think that was actually his, his first book and maybe one of his best and most popular ones. And then there was also a remake in 2013 that yeah. was fine um, <laughs> at best. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're mostly talking about the original film and, and the villain of the film who is uh, I think it's it's up for debate who the villain in this film is, but you might be surprised to know that the villain is not the person who murders a pig with a sledgehammer. Right, yeah. <laughs> Which is something a high school student does for a prank in this movie and doesn't come off being the absolute worst person in the film. Yeah, yeah, there's a shitty people. Yeah. I, I'd argue that most people in this movie are not great. And, you know, it seems like Chris is a good villain. She sucks. But yeah, Chris, Chris being the high school student yeah. who murders the pig. She sucks, but we're not covering her. But yeah, another villain for another day. Today we are talking about the even more iconic villain of this film. Margaret White, a.k.a. Carrie's mom. Yep. She's, she's a real piece of work for a lot of reasons. I mean, she's both emotionally and physically abusive to her daughter. So mm -hmm. I, I know we're, we're, we've kind of taken a joking tone, but we're going to probably talk about some serious stuff today that, yeah, you know, involves that parent-child relationship. And yeah, and this might be a content warning, right? 
there's some parental abuse, and of course, we do not condone the actions of Carrie's mom. So, so yeah, just putting that out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But before we dive in, we've got to do our 30-second intro challenge, where Tiana and I, every episode, do our best to describe the villain in 30 seconds or less, the entirety of their character, the best we can. And then you, baddies, you listeners out there, can go on to Spotify and vote for who you think did a better job. And the loser of the 30 second intro challenge this week, I think should have to do a carry like blood drop on themselves. So what do I like just get red paint? Or like, do I like stab myself? Re- reenact the famous prom scene from Carrie. In any way I can. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's good thing that I am currently in rural South Dakota. So I can just pop over to the neighbor's house. (laughs) God, that'd be horrifying. Can you imagine it? In the night, I walk over to the neighbor's house and I like take their pig or their cow and I just like chop at it. Oh my God. Chop at it. So this is what baffles me about the pig murder in the film is that it's, is that they've chosen a sledgehammer. (laughs) <laughs> that, that their weapon of choice for murdering a pig is a sledgehammer. Yeah. I, 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 why? why? Wait, in what world is that the right weapon? I don't know. I'm not the expert on pig killing, but I guess yeah. you are. <laughs> I, I'm not an expert either, but I don't know. Knife, maybe? A Gun? knife? Okay. Okay, we'll write our dissertation about, yeah, about how to properly kill an animal. Okay, who's going first? You are? Sure. All right. Three, two, one. Margaret is this super religious woman. She strongly believes in some religious values that we don't know where she got them from, but she thinks that basically everything is a sin, but particularly things involving like sexual nature, so like sexual desire, sex, anything relating to like uh, the period or sexual desire in general. That's kind of her whole deal is, and she has this daughter, Carrie, who she basically emotionally abuses because she sees her as a representation of the sin in her own life. Damn. I think I'm going to need to chop some pigs this weekend. I think I I really did a good job of nailing down one specific aspect of her. (laughs) Okay. Three, two, one, go. Okay, so Margaret is Carrie's mom, and when Carrie got her period, she found out and thought that that was sinful and made her go pray in the creepy Jesus closet. Um, And she also really did not like it that Carrie was going to go to the prom, and so she rigorously chopped carrots hysterically in her kitchen. And then later when Carrie comes back after Carrie, you know, killed all those people, her mom tries to kill Carrie. Uh, But then her mom dies in the way of Jesus, and the house burns down. Great. Yeah. Good good plot summary. Yeah. More more plotty. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be a tough vote. I think it'll be a tough Mm. vote. Not a bad thing. I'm just glad that we did something right. (laughs) Yeah. Do you want to briefly go over the plot of the movie just like really quick? Carrie gets her period. She doesn't know what it is because Margaret never told her. So that's like one aspect of villainy that she has. She gets it in the locker room of the the high school bathroom, locker room, whatever. There's this interesting sort of idyllic moment of all these naked high school (laughs) girls in the bathroom and then and then Carrie sort of rubbing herself down with a bar of soap. It's an interesting choice for a way to start the film, but I think it's sort of this dichotomy between innocence and then this idea that we're going to be presented with later in the film, which is that this sexuality and maturing process is sort of inherently sinful, uh, which, which, to be clear, Tiana and I do not believe in, but it's Margaret's religious beliefs, the villain uh, of today's episode. All the other girls basically point and laugh at her, and they're like, haha, you don't know what your period is, and you're dumb. Really make her feel like crap. And then later, Sue, uh, who's one of the girls, wants to do right by her, and wants Carrie to go to the prom with one of her friends who is a guy. Because she thinks, well, we've been really mean to Carrie, and Carrie deserves to go to prom. So Carrie yep. uh, wants to go to prom, but of course, Margaret is really against that. She says, the boys! The boys will come sniffing your blood. After the blood comes the boys. <laughs> yep. Which, uh, true. Uh- <laughs> true, yes. I do have more to say about that. But yeah, it's a whole stink. Oh, and Carrie has some, uh, you know, 
psychic abilities, some telekinesis going on throughout the film. That's kind of weird. Oh, yeah. We're 12 minutes in. We haven't touched on the fact that, <laughs> that Carrie is psychic yes. or, or telekinetic, Yeah. Uh, which I don't know if you thought about this, Tiana, but when Carrie first comes home and we see her get punished by her mom and thrown into that little closet, mm-hmm. I couldn't help but think of the chokey from Matilda. Oh. And then, of course, the other parallel with Matilda is that Carrie... And Matilda both have psychic abilities. Right, but Matilda's like the G-rated Carrie. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Matilda's sort of the G-rated Carrie. Yeah. And and I did read a very interesting fan theory online about how maybe Matilda grows up to be Carrie and Miss Honey grows up to be Margaret. That's terrible. I know. I think it's <laughs> I think it's quite a stretch yeah. of, of the imagination, but it was interesting. But I did read, and uh, I wish I had taken more notes on this so I could talk about it more, but there's sort of this thing throughout literature and pop culture about women with telekinetic powers. Yeah. We see those characters a lot. So Carrie, Matilda, that um, X-Men person, there's that movie with Anya Taylor-Joy. Yeah. Uh, of course, I didn't write down any of these examples, but there's a lot of these like big, like high profile movies about women who develop these telekinetic powers. Yeah, um, and I, I think it's it's sort of this like pent up feminist like take back what's ours kind of thing. My theory, which could be wrong, I'm just speaking out of my ass. But <laughs> women who have powers don't take on aggressive powers. And telekinesis is more of a power that is done when you're just standing there so you don't have to be aggressive. Instead, it's sly and cunning, mysterious and mischievous, and it's not as aggressive. It's not straight up aggressive like the powers that the men usually have when they have supernatural powers. Men are like big, strong, buff. They break things. They hit things. They're like the Hulk, right? But then telekinesis is a very sly probably seen as a quote-unquote feminine power. Yeah. And I think with Carrie, it's also maybe sort of like a a pent-up thing because her mom has been so controlling and and she doesn't have any friends. She sort of had to like pent up all of her emotions and like hide them and push them away. And so this telekinesis is sort of those emotions leaking out into the world and like giving her power that she's not able to realize herself. And maybe that's part of the metaphor with with all these women in telekinesis. It's giving them a power that they're not able to realize themselves because of misogyny and and the patriarchy. Yeah, we've sort of like we derailed. derailed from. <laughs> sorry, I derailed us from the the plot of the movie. That's fine. So Sue gets her boyfriend to go to prom with Carrie, which seems kind of weird. And this is this is one area where I think the remake sort of helped it out a little bit, like explain why Sue felt like her boyfriend should go to prom with Carrie. And it's because she was feeling really guilty about what she did to Carrie, making fun of her. And she didn't know how to atone for it. And she felt really, really bad. And Chris, her friend, was punished and was not allowed to go to prom. And Chris criticized Sue for still getting to go to prom. So so Sue felt really guilty that she was going to get to go to this thing. And she was like, well, if I choose not to go to prom, that's sort of me choosing the sacrifice it's not a punishment being forced on me it's a punishment i'm choosing for myself and so she believed that that was the better route to go and she genuinely wanted carrie to have a good time so i I thought the the 2013 film did a better job of giving sue a motivation for that unfortunately in both films that gives chris an opportunity to play a huge prank on carrie which is dumping a bucket of pig's blood on her when she is given prom queen which is obviously orchestrated by chris as well Carrie, in a moment of extreme emotional pain and anxiety, believes that everyone in the room is laughing at her, though they are not, actually. Mm-hmm. But I felt that was purposely vague. I believe when Carrie was in front of the room, there was a couple people, the, the people who really hated her, who were laughing. Not everyone else was laughing, but I think it was sort of like a representation of how strong that anxiety and emotion can get to be that like you feel like everybody is looking at you and laughing at you and how could she not feel that way like i you know i would probably curl up in a ball and die of anxiety at that moment and her reaction was basically she was so freaked out and scared that she burned the whole place down and killed everybody she killed everyone 
And then her mom, Margaret, I think basically feels that, you know, her daughter has sinned greatly. Oh, yeah, yeah. She she reveals at this moment that she had been in, in love with this guy and they were married and they had chosen that they weren't going to have sex. And then they did have sex. It's sort of like, mm, sort of a questionable situation as to whether it was fully consensual or not. And then she had Carrie and she she believed that her actions were sinful and that Carrie is a representation of her sin. And now Carrie's like, has his telekinetic powers. She's doing this bonkers stuff. And Margaret is just like, all right, this is all the evidence I needed that this is the devil. And so she stabs Carrie. But of course, Carrie, with her telekinetic powers, is not going to die from a a single stab. And she just like goes bananas and and, like goes bananas, (laughs) throws like a a thousand knives into her, her mom. She goes bananas and kills her mom. They both die. The end. Yep. And fire. Fire. So yeah. A heavy movie. Compelling. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we've done very little of this so far. Um, <laughs> there's so many fun things. Uh, fun. Fun's a bad word. There's so many things to talk about with this film. But yeah, let's refocus on Margaret. How did you empathize with her? All right. So let's go back to the Margaret being kind of kind of right about the boys sniffing you okay okay yeah she says the boys the boys they'll come sniffing your blood after the blood comes the boys i don't know i really like that line (laughs) big disclaimer kind of she's kind of right that the boys suck that people including the boys will laugh at you especially in high school and that the boys they'll come sniffing after you and by sniffing I think she means coming after to date you and then have sex with you. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily a bad thing if it's consensual, but it's all a very stressful situation, right? You've got these boys that will also laugh at you, but also want to have sex with you. And there's horniness and hormones and kids being immature. I do have a story about a boy being kind of sucky who not only wanted to sniff me out and date me, but also laughed at me. Was he a dog? (laughs) He was like sniff sniffing down the hall trying to find you. Yeah, he was like trying to date me, but also laughed at me. Uh, Like, it's just like a weird combination of horniness and immaturity that like high schoolers can have. And it's not always boys. Sometimes it is girls, too. But yeah, here's the story. When I was a freshman in high school, I was pretty timid, kind of like Carrie. Timid, and I, I wasn't very comfortable around boys. But a boy did ask me out on a date, and I was really, really shy. I was really nervous, and he was a year older than I was, so he was already driving. And after the date, he takes me home, and we hug. Nice. It's like a weird... (laughs) It was like my first date ever, ever, in my Uh. entire life, okay? I hug him, but then I'm so shaky and scared that after I hug him, I release, and I'm kind of in the same hugging kind of structure with my body Uh and my hand is like kind of outward still in like a hugging kind of form Mm -hmm. i'm trying really hard to explain this verbally (laughs) for listeners but yeah yeah. and i kind of just stay there and freeze uh like my hand is out still and i like i'm trying to hug like i just hugged but like i don't know what to do with my hand anymore and it's just out there stays there And of course, he noticed this, like, this is weird to him. And then a few days later, he's hanging out with his friends, and they reenact this hug together, and they laugh about it, and they post it on Facebook, and I know exactly what they're doing, and I was also told by another person in that friend group what they did, and he laughed at me, right, because I was, like, in this weird, awkward position after I hugged. But I was so timid, and I was kind of in this mode of, like, oh, I should be grateful that he even wanted to hang out with me. So I kind of let it slide. Later, he breaks up with me because I was so timid. Mm -hmm. So that only lasted a month. I'd be willing to bet money Mm -hmm. that part of the reason that he laughed about that was was because he also felt awkward about it. And to him, it was such a relief to divert that pressure onto someone else, which is not fair to you at all. That's terrible. Yeah. But I think he was probably insecure. I'm, I'm not, and I, I feel like I, I sound like I'm defending him. I'm, I'm no, actually... no, I know that you're not. And this was such a long time ago, I don't even give a crap anymore. But um, 
Yeah, yeah, I get what you mean. Because we, we were both young, very awkward people who didn't really know what to do with themselves. And so... Yeah. No, I, yeah, I get that. I mean, <laughs> my first girlfriend, we were too shy. And by we, I mean, probably mostly me in hindsight to, to even like talk to each other. So like, we didn't even talk when we hung out in person. We just talked on like MSN messenger. While you were in person, like you would like type. No, no. Oh, you would only talk over MSN messenger if you saw each other in person. Yeah. When we were in person, we were were like too shy to talk, or at least I was. Yeah. It was a very weird, awkward relationship. I, looking back, I'm like, I sometimes feel like weird about it now that I was ever like that. Yeah, the point is that high school sucks. Everyone's insecure and everyone's kind of a douche pickle. Right. And- <laughs> a horny douche pickle, right? So the point is that Margaret is kind of right that people can and oftentimes will <laughs> laugh at you in high school. I mean, depending on your high school experience. And that they'll sniff you. (laughs) Technically, you're not wrong. She does perhaps take it a little bit too far. She doesn't tell Carrie about her period. And I think an important thing to remember is that Carrie's 17 in this film, which is fairly late for getting her period. Really late. Her mom has not told her anything about it. And her mom thinks that getting a period is sinful. When presumably her mom went through the same thing. Also, yeah. And Carrie was so distressed. And she ran home and she was like, why didn't you tell me about this? I thought I was going to die. Yeah, it's bad. Anyways, that was not empathy for the mom. Because <laughs> it's already <laughs> horrifying to see blood like for the first time, like to see your period for the first time, even if you know what it is. Yeah. I mean, it's not something I've been through, obviously, <laughs> but I, I can only imagine like what that would have been like. I mean, me, me as like an anxious person already, like a pretty shy, anxious person, like like, I, I don't know if props to all the women out there that I know, because I, I don't, the I don't know how people. I would have gotten through it. The first time I got mine, I had to go to Taekwondo practice. Ooh, that <laughs> seems like not the place you want to be. We had to jump over things during the practice. Definitely like got blood stains on my Taekwondo uniform. The one thing that when I was thinking about Margaret that I kept going back to is that she's not intentionally using religion as abuse. Like, it's not like she's making a choice to like abuse Carrie and control her through her religious beliefs. Margaret actually believes the things she's saying. Like, she believes it through and through, wholeheartedly. She believes that sex is a sin. It's terrible that she believes that, but to some degree, it's like, if you believe something is the truth, then you're going to act in a way that like reflects that truth. So like, if she truly believes that all this stuff is sinful and that if you sin, you go to hell for the rest of your life, how could she not act to try to stop that? And that's not a defense of her actions. I think it's a, I, I did a lot of research on this and I, I learned a little bit about religious mania or like hyper religio- religious, religious, Excuse me. Hyper religiosity? Yeah, that's probably it. That's probably right. This is from Wikipedia. It's a psychiatric disturbance in which a person experiences intense religious beliefs or episodes that interfere with normal functioning. Uh, So it includes abnormal beliefs and a focus on religious content, which interferes with work and social functioning. And And I don't intend to like diagnose, but it does seem that Margaret's religious beliefs really, like, really interfere with her ability to function normally in life. Oh, yeah. And I also, like, don't want to tell anybody what to believe in religion-wise. Like, I, that's not a, a value of mine, but she seems to believe in something that is, in my opinion, sort of non-defensible. What she believes in, a lot of practicing Christians would say, is not Christianity, like is not actually right. that. And when I say that, when I say like, I don't believe her beliefs are defensible, what I mean is not that I think that she's necessarily a bad person, but that she is a suffering person in a sort of mania where this belief has absorbed her and taken over her life. And we don't really know why that is. Like, did she learn that? Was she taught that from an early age? Did she ever have an opportunity to like see the world in a different way? We don't really know. We're not given enough of her backstory. 
Even the backstory that we know about her with her husband and their sexual experience, she still had those religious beliefs at the point she was with her husband. So she either learned them at a younger age or, or something, or I, I don't know. Yeah. But I see her as someone who is really suffering and really deserves some help more than anything. I also have kind of a take on that too. Carrie's mom, Margaret, lives in a Western society that has a track record of interpreting the Bible in ways that harm people. And it's like she took some of those harmful interpretations and then inflated it and like created even more harmful interpretations as if that's even possible. So like she thinks periods are evidence of sin, but they don't have to be and you don't have to interpret the Bible that way, right? Westerners forget that the Old Testament was like written a long time ago in a very different context. She thinks the blood of periods is evidence of sin based on what she thinks the Bible is trying to say. But nowadays, and I do get this from a blog post from Alana Reimer, who knows a lot more about the Bible than I do. Nowadays, we know that you can actually look at the Bible and interpret blood as sacred and important. Jesus spilled blood to atone for our sins. We now know that we can even interpret the Bible as saying that period blood Long story short, and based on Old Testament context, is important. It's something to take seriously and something that you should handle delicately. She has the eyes of like a woman in 1970s America, you know, like you can't (laughs) fully understand the Bible. We still cannot fully understand it. So why are you interpreting it in ways that are harmful? And I think that's part of what's happening here. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's a combination of, of that. And I I really believe a a serious mental health issue. There's a quotation in the book version that I really love. So in the book, Carrie doesn't kill her mom with a bunch of knives. She actually uses her telekinetic abilities to slow her mom's heart down until she dies. And there's this beautiful quote where she says, I'm going to give you a present, mama. I'm picturing your heart, mama. It's easier when you see things in your mind. Your heart is a big red muscle. Mine goes faster when I use my power, but yours is going a little slower now. A little slower. Slower. So she sort of sees her mom as in pain and troubled, and she, at the end there, like believes that by killing her mom, she's sort of saving her from probably from herself and from all that she's dealt with in her mind over the years. And she doesn't murder her with a bunch of knives. She's like slows her heart down and and sort of gives her a peaceful death. It seems like Carrie also kind of empathized with Margaret a bit in the end. Yeah, because I mean Margaret's beliefs were so were so absurd mm-hmm. that if she believes these things, how could she be in a good state of mind? I guess is is my thought. For me, it, it's hard to be. It's hard to really be mad at someone for something that's out of their control when they probably could get help and get better. Again, not condoning, and she was terribly abusive to Carrie, mentally and physically. So none of that is okay. But had she received some sort of like help or intervention earlier in her life, maybe we could have avoided all that abuse. I also, for the listeners out there, like don't want you to feel like we're religion bashing at all. I think we certainly are are not. And I think that religion offers a lot of great things to a lot of people, but when it's used to hurt and abuse other people, that's that's when I start to have a real issue with it. Yeah. And I, I've grown up in a very religious household that practices Christianity. And I have met wonderful people who practice, who are Christians, who like use it in good ways, you know? Yeah. You can interpret it in ways that harm people, or you can choose to use it for good, right? Oh my god. Yes. All right. I just got my period. Like, the second? Yeah! No, I'm just kidding. Oh, <laughs> I was like, how do I react to this? Like, what is, I, I Just wanted to be a nuisance. Yeah. Carrie's mom needs help. She also needs a hobby because she's a drama queen. She's just like chopping the carrots. 
oh, she's just going through all this emotional turmoil. Do something else. Do a puzzle <laughs> while she's at prom. I don't know. Anything but chopping carrots in a dramatic way while Carrie's at prom. Yeah. Well, again, she like she really believes that mm -hmm. this path is going to take Carrie to hell for eternity. So like she's <laughs> yeah. really stressed out. Right. That is stressful. Right. If if you believe that just about everything you do in life is going to take you to hell for eternity. Yeah. Uh, imagine how stressful that life is. Right? My goodness. I think I mentioned this earlier as well. I want to read a little bit of this quotation from near the end of the movie when Margaret is explaining to Carrie what happened to her and why Carrie was born. She said, I should have killed myself when he put it in me. After the first time before we were married, Ralph promised never again. He promised and I believed him. But sin never dies. At first it was all right. We lived sinlessly. We slept in the same bed, but we never did it. And then that night I saw him looking down at me that way. We got down on our knees to pray for strength. I smelled the whiskey on his breath. Then he took me. And she goes on to talk about how she actually liked it. And then how she was so ashamed that she liked it. And so she believed that the fact that she had Carrie was the devil's work. And then now Carrie starts exhibiting these telekinetic powers and it is in her mind again because she believes so thoroughly in what she believes in the only explanation for the fact that carrie can do these things is that the devil is in her so the only choice she has is to destroy the devil because the devil is the reason that there is evil on earth this is a woman who needs help she needs a friend does she have any friends i didn't see any friends she has zero friends but to her, you know, Jesus is her friend. <laughs> yeah, she's going to have a friend for eternity in heaven. Yeah, we hope we, went to, we hope she went to heaven. I don't know if she did, but uh, I also think, um, so you create more of what you're afraid of by obsessing over it. Mm. And I think Carrie's mom, what she does is an example of this. Like she was so afraid of sin. That she, Margaret, became reeling with sin and devilish qualities when she treated her daughter poorly and, like, in a sinful way. And then sin permeated throughout the household and likely conditioned her daughter to use sin and, quote-unquote, being devilish as a survival tactic and to be a punisher, like, with her psychic powers. Like, she's giving too much power to things that should not have so much power, right? Like, uh -huh. she deems so many things as sexual and obsesses over sexuality and sexuality being sinful, so then everything is going to be sexual to her. Like, you're just creating more of what you're obsessing over. Like, boobs do not need to be sexual, but she focuses on that and thinks, oh, you're being too sexual by existing with a nipple. And I'm also guilty of obsessing over things and maybe creating more of it, not to the same degree as Margaret, but, like, for example, if I'm obsessing over, like, saying the wrong thing... And I obsess and I obsess and obsess and obsess and obsess. Then I end up saying the wrong thing. <laughs> no, I absolutely feel that. Yeah, you know, stop creating more of what you don't want by obsessing over it. That's very insightful. And I'm, I'm now sort of like thinking about it in my own mind. Cause, yeah. Because, yeah, there, there are things that I obsess over that aren't things at all. Mm -hmm. They're only a thing because, because I'm focusing all my time and attention on it. Ugh. There you go. Learn from Margaret, I guess. Do you want to talk about the question or? Yeah, I think so. Not, not that we haven't done this already, but to sort of empathize with Carrie's mom, Margaret, on a more personal level, she has these sort of intense religious beliefs that she believes are the truth, even though the people around her do not. So I'm kind of wondering, are there things that you believe in, Tiana, that other people around you may not believe are the truth, but to you, they're very real things? So I'll say first that I'm not the only one who believes this. Uh, in fact, I have heard this from other people that I respect, and I'm trying my best to adopt it into my own life. It's going to sound very hippy-dippy. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm usually not this cheesy of a person. Actually, no, I'm a pretty cheesy person. But uh, I think that love is the foundation for everything. <laughs> I'm not, uh, <laughs> I mean, 
mean, it's not, I'm not laughing. You're laughing at me. <laughs> They're all going to laugh at the you. The boys are laughing at me. It's not a bad, I mean, of the things <laughs> that you could believe, that's, it's not a bad one. I think, yeah, I think love creates all, sustains all. And I believe that by maintaining love, we can have a better world and a better society. Yeah, that's, that's very nice. Thank you. Uh, and again, I didn't mean to laugh. It was, <laughs> it, it was sort of the way you presented it. <laughs> um, but um, love. It's a very nice thought. And it's a nice thought. Again, of the things you could believe, I think that's that's one that's probably worthwhile. Thank you. Even if others disagree. Right. How about you? Yeah, I, I guess maybe I'll, I'll I'll go the less optimistic route. And sort of, sort of more internally, I, I have a lot of like shame, like anxiety and shame around like expressing myself, like like being like openly sort of emotionally raw, and like what people will think of me if I express my emotions. And because I feel that way about myself, I often sort of feel that way about other people who are like overly emotional. So sometimes, like I feel like. People who are really overly emotional and overly expressive, like I, I feel that they're embarrassing or like I feel like ashamed by the way that they're acting. And Tell me more of how you think of me, Joe. No, no, no. <laughs> my point is that it, it's a reflection of my own shame towards myself. It's that feeling that those things are shameful that is sort of like, unfortunately, a core belief of mine that I have a hard time moving past that feels true to me. I don't want it to feel true, but it does feel true. But I know that other people don't feel that way because I know from talking to other people that they don't, I mean, I'm sure some people do, but most other people don't have those same feelings about those same situations and those same actions. And that if I was to go out and be emotionally expressive and raw, that most people probably wouldn't laugh at me or feel embarrassed about me. But that's a truth that like feels true within me that I have a hard time letting go of, that I would like to let go of so that I could go out and be expressive and so that I also didn't feel that way towards other people. I know you're kind of working on it on your own, you know, in your <laughs> own way, but would it help you to know that people might even respect you more if you let yourself be more raw? Yeah, and I think I know that. Mm -hmm. But you have to internalize it. Yeah. And that's kind of what I'm working on right now. That's actually, to be honest, probably the biggest thing I'm working on right now in therapy and, and just in my life in general is how to kind of let go of that, that shame. I, I want to be expressive. Like I have this innate desire to express myself and get over this strong like feeling of that this thing is wrong or to, to relate it back to Margaret that it's sinful. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't think of it as sin, but that's sort of the metaphor, right? Yeah. Going back to Margaret, you want to heal from this, or you want to change, I guess, so that when you have a kid, you know, you don't accidentally kind of pass on that belief that expression equals embarrassment. Yeah, and also, like, I don't want to grow to resent my child, even if I don't have a child. I don't want to grow to resent my friends or my loved ones because they're acting a certain way that makes me feel something internally that I'm ashamed of. Yeah, I, I want to get past that. And I, I wish that Margaret had that same sort of desire and or that she had grown up in a system or with people around her that could have helped her rather than sort of push her further into her mania. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I heard you might have a poem you'd like to share I do. with our listeners. Okay, brace yourself, okay? Because I'm this braced. is a poem written from Margaret Wright's perspective, Carrie's mom. So I am going to take on the character of her. Oofta. Here we go. Okay, so before I start, though, I'm going to do kind of like an eek chop kind of sound with my poem. And that's the reenactment of her chopping carrots in a hysterical way, like she does in the film while Carrie is at prom. Yeah. Okay. There, so I, I think you're referring to what I believe is sort of an iconic <laughs> horror movie sound yeah. that we hear in this film and Psycho and I think other slasher films from that time period, which is like that. Yeah, kind of. Kind, kind of. of noise. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. 
Yeah, so that that's what's going on. Pretend she's chopping carrots hysterically. All right. <clears throat> Eek! Chop! Eek! Chop! Eek! Chop! Everything engulfs me. I was right. She is the devil. Ba-boom! Boom, cackle lightning in the background. I am unraveling like a dead turkey shedding its skin on Thanksgiving morning. Hot and glorious on the table. I am a reminder to pray so that you don't get gobbled up. Eek! Chop. Eek! Chop. But I was right. She is sinful. My beloved daughter, she didn't pray enough. I warned her. I warned you. Fear tells us who to become, what to say, what to do, so you don't become the charcoal that the devil slips into his mouth tomorrow. Eek! Chop. Eek! Chop. You think me unbearable, but I'm the one who reminded you to pray. Eek! Oh. Chop. <laughs> Eek! Chop. Okay, the end. <laughs> well, you got you got me with that surprise yes, chop. Yes, that's what I was trying um, to do. I also feel like you you really did a good job I, with the accent. I think was yeah was strong. It takes place in Maine, but <laughs> her mom has a southern accent, a mild southern accent. Yeah, I never thought about that. Yeah, maybe she's she's probably from the south. Maybe. Yeah, that was great. I'll leave you with a little poem of my own, which is not of my own. It's it's a line, a, a bit of text from the story. I think this is Carrie speaking. While she, I, I think it's Carrie speaking while she's being punished in the closet. And mm. I think it's rather sad and beautiful. She said, um, Jesus watches from the wall, but his face is cold as stone. And if he loves me as she tells me, why do I feel so all alone? Aww. Because it's not actually God or Jesus. Like, it's just like mm -hmm. a made up version of it. <laughs> yeah. That Jesus in the and, in the closet is not Jesus, by the way. No, he's maybe I don't know what this is, but I don't remember Jesus having daggers throughout his body. Mm, uh, is that a like? When did that happen? I mean, I wasn't there. Right. <laughs> I guess I, I yeah, I don't like when I watched Passion of the Christ. I don't remember them stabbing him like seven times in the chest. Yeah, I don't know. Do you um, have thoughts about Margaret? About Carrie in general? any of the other villains of this film. We didn't even touch on the high school teacher who thought it was okay to slap her student. <laughs> it was the 70s. It was wild. It was the 70s. And also in the 2013 movie, the teacher also slapped the student, which I thought was bonkers. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's kind of weird. And still not okay. Mm -hmm. So if you have thoughts about this film, why don't you? There's a lot of things to think. There and you are. can send them to us at nextdoorvillain at gmail.com, to our Instagram at nextdoorvillain, Twitter, nextdoorvillain, TikTok probably, <laughs> um, Facebook. You can find us at the places. We're, we're always happy to hear from you. You can rate us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you write us a review, we will we'll probably read it on an episode. We'll give you a little shout out, especially if it's good, but probably if it's bad too. <laughs> Hopefully it's good. Next Door Villain is written and produced by Joe Anderson and Tiana Hennings. Uh, we do all the work because we're just a couple of little independent podcasters working from our home. We're average Joes. I'm also an and average Tiana's. Joe. Average Tiana's. We're, we're average Joes and we're super Tiana's. Aww. Anyways, that that's. I think I think that'll be the end of the episode. Thanks for listening, everyone. The devil. Thanks again for listening to Horror Fanatic by Indie Drop-In Network. If you would like to nominate a podcast for feature, just send me a tweet at Indie Drop-In. Indie Drop-In Network has many other shows you might enjoy. You 
can check them out at IndieDropIn.com. I'll put all the links at the bottom of the show notes to make it easy. All right, see you next time.